Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk about a remarkable new release. Uh, the complete RCA recordings of Marion Anderson. This is some production, let me tell you. First, let's talk about the technical details. What you get is a coffee table book, a serious coffee table book, with biographical information, oodles of photographs, a complete discography for of the RCA recordings anyway, along with all of that track information and recording data and stuff like that. And the discs themselves are contained in this gate folded sort of sleeve thing, which is actually very nice. And these are theoretically designed because they're slightly indented to preserve the discs without damage and keep them in their, in their case thing. Here they are on the back end. I would only say one thing because there has to be an issue. Do not turn this upside down. Do not even think about turning it upside down or even tipping it upside down because the CDs will fall out. I found that out the hard way. They do slide out. Other than that, this is a magnificent package. It's 15 discs. It sells for about 80 bucks um, because you're getting, you know, a, a fabulous production here. It's beautifully done. It's absolutely beautifully done. And there's, it, it truly, truly does justice to Marian Anderson, to the singer. And that is something that doesn't happen that often these days. And of course, the reason it does justice to Marian Anderson and the whole intent of the marketing of this production is because she was so much more than a mere singer. She was an icon. She was a civil rights activist. She was really an unintentional civil rights activist in a sense because she was just trying to have a career as a singer. But in so doing, she, she really, uh, there are no African-American singers who came after her who were not in some ways influenced by the trail that she blazed. And she did it with absolutely consummate dignity, humility, class. I, she was the perfect person to do what she did. She actually had quite a long life. Most people don't realize it. She was born in 1897. She passed away in 1993. She was the aunt of the conductor James DePriest, and she spent most of her life living on her on her farm in Danbury, or just outside Danbury, Connecticut, which is where my father grew up and my grandfather had his auto parts store, and she was always in the neighborhood, apparently, along with Charles Ives and some other people like that, which is just marvelous. I'm so into anything from Connecticut, my my basic native state. So yes, go Connecticut, the other great figure from Connecticut. Well, there were several. Leroy Anderson wound up spending most of his career in New Haven, although he wasn't from there originally. And, and the big one, Rosa Poncel, was from Connecticut. So I mean, it's just having such a, it's a fascinating thing when you look at it, when you look at it. But she was actually born in Philadelphia, Marian Anderson, and wound up in Connecticut. Uh, that's one bit of Marian Anderson lore that I just had to throw out there. The other is this, the event that made her, that brought her to international attention, and many of you will already know this, was the outdoor concert in 1939 at the Lincoln Memorial. And the reason she gave an outdoor concert at the Lincoln Memorial is because she was originally booked to perform at Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. Well, she wasn't booked. She wanted to perform there. That hall was owned and run by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Now, the Daughters of the American Revolution is, is, is inexplicably bizarre, if you really want to know. I mean, I, you, you, I've had, I had my own run-in with the Daughters of the American Revolution that I just have to tell you about. The Daughters of the American Revolution is obviously a, a women's organization consisting of ladies who have a direct descendant to somebody who fought in or was alive or involved in the Revolutionary War, the American Revolution in 1776. And you cannot be a daughter of the American Revolution unless you can 
prove your ancestry back to that time. Now, there were many, many African American people who could prove their ancestry back to that time and who may have fought in the Revolutionary War or were involved with people who fought in the Revolutionary War, but that did not impress the daughters of the American Revolution. They did not want black people as part of their organization, not for any reason. And of course, they owned the Constitution Hall. And not only would they not allow black people per to perform there, but the big threat, the big fear they had was that that would necessarily involve a mixed audience because Washington in 1939 was a segregated city. Hard as that may be for us to imagine or believe now, it was. It was appalling. It was just barbaric, really, the whole thing. But Washington was a segregated city, and they were afraid that a mixed audience would cause a scandal because the Daughters of, American, of the American Revolution were nothing if not high society types, or at least many of them were. So as a result of them denying um, Marian Anderson permission to perform in Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C., Eleanor Roosevelt resigned as a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, writing a hate letter. And most of the press took Marian Anderson's side, of course, at least in the North. And as a result of that, um, FDR and Eleanor and, and, you know, the Secretary of State and other people got together and agreed to allow her to perform at an outdoor concert on Easter Sunday. 1939 in front of the Lincoln Memorial. That concert was attended by about 75,000 people and it was broadcast over the radio nationally and millions of people heard it. And that established Marian Anderson as an icon for equality and for the rights of African Americans. And, and from that point on, she ceased to become a singer. She was a cultural object. And that had, of course, its its pluses and minuses. It was, uh, you know, it ensured her fame for reasons that had nothing whatsoever to do with art and with music. Uh, but more to the point, um, she she really, really just wanted to sing. And then the next sort of milestone that happened after that 1939 concert was that in 1955, she became the first African American to take the stage in a major role at the Metropolitan Opera. She sang Ulrika in Verdi's Un Ballo and Mascara, but that was the only time she appeared at the Met. She was not basically an operatic singer. That wasn't her fach. And she did it. And it was a big deal. And after she did it, the, the, the doors uh, opened for African American singers of various, various types, male and female. And the rest, as they say, is history. But Marian Anderson was the first in, to sort of, you know, broach the gates of high culture. And uh, she did it with her typical grace and modesty and intelligence and uh, it really made everybody look very, very small and stupid. But now, let me take a moment and tell you about the daughters of the American Revolution. When I was in grammar school, I was in fourth grade particularly, we had to do an essay contest for the daughters of the American Revolution. We had to write some essay on a patriotic or American uh, theme of some kind, American historical theme. I don't remember what it was you won if you did it. All I know is that the misery of having to do it was somewhat assuaged by the fact that one of these old biddies had to read all these essays written by fourth and fifth graders and decide which ones were going to be which ones were going to be recognized for their superior, whatever it was they were looking for. We had a teacher. She taught second grade, I believe, in my grammar school, who was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Her name was Miss Alexander. She was unforgettable. She was about four and a half feet tall and 175 years old. You'll notice her name was Miss Alexander, and there was a reason she remained a Miss for her entire life. She had been in the Army, and she was also a daughter of the American Revolution, and she wore her full uniform and medals and regalia and ribbons and sashes every single day to class. 
And not only was she a daughter of the American Revolution, I think she probably started the American Revolution. She was there, <laughs> believe me. She had firsthand experience of the American Revolution. No one knew exactly how old she was. Um, she had whiskers periodically coming out of her chin and she had this gravelly voice like this and she was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And one of the things that happened when I was quite young, when I was in fourth and fifth grade, basically, is that is that the schools in Milford, Connecticut began busing inner city kids from New Haven, African-American students. And they were, let's put it this way, that caused quite a stir. It was not a happy time, I think, either for for the busies or the busors because it caused hysteria. And Miss Alexander hated these kids. And we would walk down the hall. She would lie in wait, you know, in her classroom. And we'd walk down the hall completely innocently. And when an African-American kid walked by, this bony hand would reach out and grab them by the ear and pull them into her classroom. And what, what she did to them, I have no idea or why, but she was always watching the playground to try and see if she could identify misbehavior. It was just awful. It was truly, truly awful. I mean, the teachers were bigots. It was disgusting. And I know, I know because there were only a couple of Jews in the whole school and I was the object of their bigotry, just like the black kids were. So of course, we, we became friends because we were, we, were, we were on the outs. We were the outsiders. And in those days, in those days, we were permitted, believe it or not, to walk home for lunch if you lived close by to the school. And I lived quite close. I could walk to school every day. So at lunchtime, me and my African-American friends would walk home and my mother would have lunch ready for us because it was safe and we wouldn't be molested. And then we would walk back to school afterwards. And that is my memory of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And it wasn't just the African-American kids who got it from Miss Alexander. My own best friend, who was my next door neighbor, um, was despised by Miss Alexander. And all, it was another one where every time he walked by her classroom, the bony hand of doom would come out and haul him in. And I don't know what she did to him, but he did pass away from alcoholism. And I'm sure that Miss Alexander and the Daughters of the American Revolution had something to do with it. I'm absolutely convinced. So that is the impression of the Daughters of the American Revolution as seen through the eyes of a fourth grader. And the fact that Marian Anderson was the person to stick it to him is just fabulous. Of course, now they admit African-American members, but you know, in the 1950s, I think, or the 70s or something, they finally started to do that. But you know, why anyone would want to join them, I have absolutely no idea. Maybe they're less horrifying now, but they were pretty scary then. At least Miss Alexander was, if she was an exemplar of the whole crew. But lastly, we can talk about music. Marian Anderson is a little bit controversial as a singer. You know, I, Toscanini said she had a voice that comes along once a century, and, you know, Sibelius wrote some songs for her. They were friends. She had, uh, she was pretty universally admired. She had an extraordinary voice, but it was sort of like Maria Callas's. It was strange. And you either loved it or you didn't. She billed herself as a contralto, but the fact of the matter is she had an enormous range. She could basically sing anything from baritone to high mezzo. And it was all perfectly even and, and without any strain. But the voice itself always had a certain quavery sort of you might call it a vibrato, I suppose, but but it wasn't really it wasn't that annoying. First of all, at least not to me, and second of all, actually it didn't get worse as she got older. It sort of dried out and thinned out, and and got less as she got older. But because she was born in 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 1897, and because there were so few opportunities for performance for African American artists, she didn't really start making records until she was close to past her prime. You know, she was she wrote recorded until about 1966, but everything after 1950 was sort of iffy. I mean, the voice was steadily in decline, and you and, and it was in decline, and you hear this very clearly. So you have to take you know the later work with uh, you know with that in mind. You can't you can't deny the musical facts. Her best recordings were made in the 19 basically the 1930s and 40s. 
and like I said, up till about 1950. But the thing about it is that even when she was in decline, she was an amazing singer. I mean, just as an artist, as a singer, she was one of the most communicative singers that I've ever heard that you'll ever hear. She just inhabited the music that she sang. I mean, the example, one of the, the classic examples, I think, is, is the song, the Schubert song, Erlkönig, which uh, she sang three times on here. There are three different record performances of it. And it is unbelievable the way she characterizes the three parts. The father, she sounds like a guy. I mean, you can't believe it's the same singer. And the little child is the little child. The narrator is the narrator. There's actually four people. And then the Earl Koenig has this thin, ethereal voice. She really, really lives the music and puts it across with an immediacy that's just extraordinary. And of course, she was a a uniquely American singer. I, I think it importantly for other American type singers because obviously her native language was English. She had to learn all of the others. She had amazing diction. And I say that as distinct from pronunciation because I've heard her criticized for her pronunciation of, for example, German or Italian or other languages. And maybe it was a little bit off. No more off than a million other singers these days, I might add. But but her diction, you can hear the fact that her pronunciation is off. She pronounced the words with incredible, incredible clarity. There's very little that she sings that you can't understand what she's singing in whatever language she sings it. And of course, she was renowned for doing for her spirituals, her records of spirit, spirituals and her records of you know sacred or devotional music. That was her background. That was her belief system. And she sang them with, with completely unaffected nobility and simplicity and immediacy of expression and passion. And it really didn't matter in what shape her voice was in because it was it was several decades into her career before she actually was able to get to get any kind of professional training because she was African American. The same situation. So so you can't really judge her in the same way that you would judge other singers who've all had the same backgrounds. They all went to Juilliard. They all studied with so-and-so. They all attended this master class. She was an original, absolutely an original. And now I just want to tell you what's in here. And you'll know if you want to hear it or not. I, I think everybody should hear it. I really do. I, she was also, by the way, um, a, a stunningly beautiful woman. Uh, let's not leave that little tidbit out. That also has nothing to do with music. But the fact that she was, I think, so graceful and gracious in person um, had a lot to do with the aura that surrounded her in performance, you know, in a live performance. So I have to look. It's like the track listings actually don't start until page 50-something in here. It's not so simple um, to find exactly what's on the disc. But here's disc one. Okay, disc one is spirituals, recordings that she made from 1923 to 1946, followed by the early electric recordings, 1936 to 1946, which are songs of all kinds. And that's the sense in which she was American. She sang everything. She had to sing everything. She had no, aside from spirituals, which were her, her tradition, you know, she, her, her singing of, art songs of leader I mean, that was all pumped into her as it would be for most american singers after her whether they were african-american or not she had her biggest successes of course in europe where the bigotry and prejudice was not was not as automatic and as nasty as it was in the united states so that anyway is disc one disc two is leader songs and melody and this is 1936 to 1951 and it is extraordinary. I mean, the stuff that she does. She does the, the Sibelius songs that Sibelius rewrote for her. Um, and she does stuff by Massenet and Rachmaninoff. And sometimes in translation, sometimes not. And Fritz Lehmann and Cyril Scott. And, and uh, it's unbelievable the range of material that she sang. Stephen Foster, of course. And then, uh, oh, all kinds of other things like that. So there's that stuff. And she was accompanied in a lot of these things by Eugene Ormandy. And in the Alto Rhapsody, which she does three times in this set, 
once with Eugene Ormandy, once with, I think, Fritz Reiner, and once with um, Robert Shaw. Uh, we'll get to those as we get to them. So that's disc two. Disc three, Baroque arias. First, there's a whole pile of Bach arias. You get, you know, the the usual ones, you know, Erbarmadich from the St. Matthew Passion. And let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, yes, you know, Bereite Dich, uh, Zion, and a whole bunch of things like that. And then you get great songs of faith. These were, of course, um, standards for Marian Anderson, as well as for actually quite a few singers in those days. It's funny, singers don't make great songs of faith recordings as much anymore in the less religious society in which they live. But um, these are very, very beautiful, heartfelt performances. And then let's see, disc four, leader by Brahms, Mahler, and Strauss. Yes, let's see, the Brahms is the Alto Rhapsody. Um, and then, pardon me, in this case, it's, let's see who's doing it. Oh, it's the San Francisco Symphony. No, it's not. I'm sorry, this is the one with Robert Shaw. Um, and the Robert Shaw, the RCA Victor Symphony, and it's conducted by Fritz Reiner. Let me get it straight. This is the Reiner Alto Rhapsody. Then she does the Kindertone Leader with Pierre Monteau and the San Francisco Symphony. And that's one heck of a Kindertone Leader. I love the performance as much for Monteau as for Marian Anderson, but it is one of the most moving and all the more moving for not dragging. The tempi are rather quick and my God, is it immediate and gripping. It's an extraordinary kindertone leader, it really is. You really ought to hear it if you don't know it. This was, it was recorded in 1950. She was still in, in relatively decent voice, starting to fray around the edges, but wow, what a performance of that. And then some Strauss leader and the Brahms Four Serious Songs. And then uh, another alto rhapsody, in that case with Pierre Monteux. I mean, you can't have enough alto rhapsodies, can you? You get two of them on the same disc, my goodness. I hope you like the alto rhapsody. And then let's see, we have Leader by Schubert and Schumann. She does Frauen Liebe und Leben. Oh God, I hate that. Well, I know. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's very moving. Yes, of course, it's very moving. It's the dumbest poetry in the world. I, I know, I said I hated it during our leader talk and you all jumped all over me for it, but I, I just think it's embarrassing. And then uh, the Schubert stuff, this is where you have the first of the Earl Koenigs. And by goodness, and her also her death and death in the maiden and the trout. And at some point she does, she does Gretchen, yes, Gretchen on Spinrod, holy cow. It'll knock your socks off. It's just extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. I wish I could play you samples. You can probably get most of these things on YouTube. I'm sure they're out there on there. If you want to check it out for yourself, do try and hear her do Earl Koenig. It's just, you're not going to believe it. Then disc six is spirituals. Um, and let's see, they are absolutely fantastic, as you might expect. Disc seven is highlights from Verdi's A Masked Ball, Un Ballo and Mascara. Here we get to hear her, her Ulrika. Now the Met, in its productions, has released the complete performance, or one of the complete performances in which she participated, um, which is not very good. Bob Levine um, reviewed that for ClassicsToday.com, the whole performance, you know, not just her. Um, she's not so hot either at that point. Um, on the recording here, it's conducted by Dimitri Metropolis with the Met Orchestra, with Zinka Milanoff and, and Jan Pierce and Roberta Peters. I mean, it's quite a cast. And the excerpt disc, I think, is, is better than the live disc. And she sounds better than the live disc, but you get a sense. You know, she did it because she knew that she could. And it was uh, something that she could never have turned down. She was past her prime. This was, what, 55. Opera was not really her thing. And, uh, you know, it's okay. It's okay, but let's not, let's not kid ourselves, shall we? Um, we have to be honest about these things. But, but it was a historical moment, an absolutely historical moment. And not like a horrible historical moment, like Fort Fengler's Nazi performance of You Know What by Beethoven. Um, you know, there was, there was, it was a good historical moment, not a horrifying historical moment. Uh, next, there is, is another disc of spirituals, that's disc eight. And let's see, 
Let's get to disk nine. I hope I'm not leaving anything out here. But see, like you have to go through page after page after page. You get session photos of every variety and and original jacket notes and essays and I mean it's wonderful to have all this stuff. It's just a little hard to find. As usual with some of these historical coffee table productions, they're made for their deluxeness rather than for their ease of use. Um, that's uh, Christmas carols. And we get a couple discs. Uh, these are like a couple discs slammed together of Christmas music. And let's see. What's next? Uh, songs by Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, Strauss, and Haydn. I love the Haydn songs in here. She does the spirit song. She never told her love and a pastoral song. Pardon me, there's other Haydn later. And Schubert is Der Doppelganger and and Der Jungling und, und Der Tod. And she does Schumann stuff. And Richard Strauss is Morgan and a bunch of Brahms songs. And it, it's really, and some of it, let's see, is again with Philly and Ormandy because they orchestrated some of them, which is even more fun. They're in orchestral arrangements, which I always enjoy. And let's see, that's disc 10. Disc 11, Songs at Eventide, arrangements by Robert Russell Bennett. And these are, you know, so, you know let's see, the Brahms Lullaby and Annie Laurie and and How Gently Sweet Afton and Evening Prayer by Engelbert Humperdinck, you know that, from Hansel and Gretel, Dvorak's Songs My Mother Taught Me, yeah, music of great charm, somewhat ephemeral, some of them, I suppose, but no harm there. I hope this is just giving you some sort of sense of the range of repertoire. It really is, really was astounding. Then we have uh, this 12 is her farewell recital at Constitution Hall, it's a live, it's a live concert, which contains another Earl Koenig. She's not in such great voice for this farewell recital. It's it's a bit of a stretch. But one of the things that was interesting about her is that even when her voice was going, it was always even. It went evenly. In other words, in other words, she could sing from high to low without any kind of strain. It was all of a piece, her voice. No matter, no matter what she was doing with it, it's really kind of amazing. So once you get used to it, it's thinner and drier, you just deal with it. Then there's, let's see, disc, disc 13 is called Just Keep On Singing, 12 Spirituals. And disc 14, which is the last one that's sort of musically relevant to us, um, is Schubert and Brahms' Leader, which contains yet another Earl Koenig, and a whole bunch of other things, and another Death of the Maiden, and the Trout, and Andi Musik, and you know, she she had her repertoire of those things. And and the, the Brahms leader are von Ewig Liebe, and Botschaft, and uh, Der Schmied, and, and uh, oh, a bunch of other things. So that's basically it, disc 15, and, and here she is, it's actually nice to see her <laughs> outdoors and in a color photo, there we go, uh, that's, the last album I think that she ever made, and then the uh, the the 50th album is basically the soundtrack of um, a sort of newsreel uh, describing her her travels throughout the Far East, and it's not, I, I don't find it terribly interesting, but it was it, it's there and it's uh, you know a document of her career. So where does that leave us? The great impression that I get after hearing all of this stuff, which I haven't listened to in years, and it's very well remastered, everything sounds as good as it has ever has, I think, is 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 her singing, you know, one of her great encores is, is, is he's got the whole world in his hands, the spiritual. And she had the whole of music in her voice, in a way. What I mean is, I don't mean that it's a, it's greatness. I don't mean it in that sense. I'm talking about in terms of comprehensiveness, because here was this this African American lady, an outsider, an other in the world of music, who sang absolutely anything and everything she could wrap her voice around, and and really proved by her performance, by her music making by her, her artistry and intelligence, no matter how shabby the voice eventually got, that 
it's the whole world in her hands, that everybody is one, that everything is, is a unity, a unity in music. And that is what I think she represented. There was, there was that really very real quality to what she did. And I think a very real intelligence behind what she did. What she basically told people was, I have got as much right to sing this stuff as anybody else. And I'm going to sing it as well as anybody else. I'm going to sing it with as much meaning and passion and expressiveness as anybody else. And screw you, Miss Alexander. <laughs> that's, that's what she was saying. And the daughters of the American Revolution and all of these, all of these, these annoying elite organizations that were trying to shut her out and which still exist today and still try and shut various minorities out of various types for their own stupid and irrelevant reasons. But the fact of the matter is that the music is one thing. It's one thing that we all share. And Marian Anderson really demonstrated that 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 truth. I, I truly believe that. I absolutely believe it in my heart that that's what she achieved. And that's why she's more than just a singer. She is a cultural icon. And I think that this tribute is extremely well made, extremely well made and worthy of her. And that's saying a lot. So kudos to Sony for putting it together. And now it's up to you to sample her work and see if you want to invest in this or if you would rather just continue to sample her work. But you really have to hear it. You have to hear it. You have to hear the Schubert songs. You have to hear the Kindertot leader. You have to hear at least one or two alto rhapsodies. And of course, the spirituals, which are, you know, unique. That's all mandatory listening if you care about music in my view so keep on listening folks let's make america classical again thank you for joining me take care <laughs>